Hey everyone, I'm Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's video. I hope that it encourages you and I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that you have some community around you to be able to talk through some of these concepts and truths with. If you don't have community like that, we would love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore. You can learn all about it on our website at restoreaustin.org. So click there and get all the information that you need. I hope that we see you soon at one of our gatherings, and I hope that you enjoy this message. I love personality tests. I first kind of got into them because of a high school psychology class where we had to take one called the Myers-Briggs. I'd never heard of it before, and I wasn't super interested in taking it. I wasn't super interested in schoolwork, honestly, at that point in my life. But I remember reading my results afterwards and being absolutely floored. I am on the Myers-Briggs, what's called an ENTJ, and I remember I read the descriptions for ENTJs, and it felt like someone had written it specifically about me. I I, I was in love. I asked my teacher, are there any other tests like the Myers-Briggs, and she began introducing me to all kinds of stuff, including one test which told me if I was a lion, an otter, a golden retriever, or a beaver. On that one, I ended up being 50% lion and 50% beaver which kind of freaked me out a little bit because the computer kind of superimposed the two animals together on the results screen, and it looked really weird. But other than that minor speed bump, I was off and running with personality tests. Now I take almost every new one that comes out, and I use a wide range of them when hiring staff or doing leadership assessments. I think they're really helpful. My favorite one is probably the Enneagram. The Enneagram is actually the oldest personality test with its origins tracing back to the fourth century. And it divides people into one of nine different personality types and assigns them one of nine numbers. In case you were wondering, I'm a three. I could probably talk to you about what that means and about your number and what your number means for a few hours. I actually know that a bunch of you share this love of the Enneagram too because this week I asked people on Facebook what their number was and over a hundred of you responded, telling me your number, telling me more about the Enneagram. Others of you jumped in and said, you wanted to take it, where can I take it? Um, And so I know that there's this like, we, we like to learn about ourselves. We like to understand how we are wired. And I love personality tests for a variety of reasons, but more than anything, I love them because they help reveal just how much each of us has been uniquely created by God. Now, you may not know it, but you are unique. You are one of a kind. Have you ever seen companies do limited releases of exclusive items? It doesn't matter if it's baseball cards or luxury cars. Every limited release has one thing in common. They display the numbers. They display the numbers. Let me show you what I mean. This is a limited release of the 2007 Volkswagen Fahrenheit. It has a turbocharged engine that can go from zero to 100 in seven seconds. But what makes this car really valuable is how rare it is. It's a limited release and it proudly displays the numbers. Here's a picture of the steering wheel. So this particular car is numbered 625, and each of the Volkswagen Fahrenheits has its specific number right there on the steering wheel. These cars are rare. There's only been 1,200 ever made, and they proudly display those numbers. Here's another example. A Spanish wine company only released 99 bottles of this particular year's batch of handmade red wine, and they proudly display those numbers on every bottle. This wine is very rare. But my friends, you are not rare. You are unique. And those are two different things. You see, the Oxford Dictionary defines unique as being the only one of its kind, unlike anything else. You are not one of 1,200 like the Volkswagen. You are not one of 99 like the wine. You are one of one. You are the only one of your kind. The psalmist reflected on this truth when he wrote, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your worksmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Science backs this truth up as well. Did you know there are almost 8 billion people alive right now? And although it's only an educated guess, experts estimate that around 100 billion people have ever lived throughout the course of human history. 
Every single one of the 8 billion people alive today and the 100 billion people who have ever lived are unique. There was an article in Forbes a few years back called How Many Possible Combinations of DNA Are There? The article was written by this PhD in microbiology guy named Drew Smith. And Dr. Smith cites the work of various scholars and experts as he explains that the number of possible DNA combinations is, quote, essentially infinite. My favorite part of the article is when Dr. Smith is talking about trying to quantify the much smaller number of how many traits can be embodied by DNA. Even that number, he says, is a number so large that it is meaningless. But undeterred, Dr. Smith tries to calculate that large, meaningless number by plugging this extensive formula into his high-powered calculator. But when he hit the equals button, the calculator literally said, not a number. It is right there where it was supposed to display the number of the formula. It just said, not a number. There are literally infinite versions of humanity. There has never been, nor will there ever be, someone exactly like you. God made you unique. We talk about our individual uniqueness and restores core value of diversity, which starts out by saying, God has made all of us differently, but he has made all of us valuable. But even though our uniqueness is incredible in and of itself, it's not even the most amazing part about being a human. Because God didn't just make each of us uniquely. He loves each of us uniquely. He didn't just make each of us uniquely. He loves each of us uniquely. You see, God doesn't love with a one-size-fits-all kind of love. He doesn't just hand out carbon copies of his affection to everyone. He loves people uniquely and intimately based on how he created each of us. The way he loves me is not the same as the way he loves you. It's just as powerful and as beautiful and as relentless, but it's not the same because you and I are two different people. And God loves us with two different kinds of love. I know that because of my personal experiences with God. But I also know it because of stories from Scripture, like the one we are going to look at this morning. Today, we are continuing in our teaching series called Kingdom Incarnate. Each week, we dive into a story from the life of Jesus where he embodies God's kingdom, this new world order and new way of living that Jesus came to teach us about and to demonstrate. Now, today's story is recorded in John's account of Jesus' life, chapter 11, starting in verse 1. You can turn there, you can get on your phone, you can Google search it, or the verses will be on the screen and you can follow along there. John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister, Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the, lo- the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha, Mary, And Lazarus. Mary and Martha and Lazarus are prominent characters throughout the life of Jesus. We know they're some of his closest friends and that he often stays with them at their home in Bethany when he is traveling to Jerusalem. It's certainly possible that their relationship dates back much further actually than adulthood. There's a good chance that he even grew up around them, stopping at their home on his family's annual trips to Jerusalem from Nazareth or Galilee for the Passover festival. My guess is that Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus had many a slumber party as kids and developed close friendships that lasted their entire lives. Because right off the bat, we see the intimacy between them in this story. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, and the messengers describe Lazarus simply as the one you love. Jesus doesn't need any further description. He knows exactly who they are talking about. And then verse 5 really is the foundational passage in this entire story. Jesus loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, yes, he loves them collectively, but he also has a deeply personal relationship with each of them as individuals. He loves them collectively, but he also loves them uniquely. And let me show you what I mean as we look at this next part of the story. 
So a short time later, Jesus tells his disciples that they are going to travel to Bethany in order to help Lazarus. Jesus chooses to go against the advice of his disciples who remind him that the last time he was in that area, the people actually tried to stone him. But Jesus knows the risk. He is propelled by his love for these siblings, so he chooses to go anyway. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. So, when Jesus arrives in Bethany, Lazarus has already been dead for four days, and many folks are there comforting the family. Now, I want you to pay attention to how uniquely Jesus relates to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The first one he encounters is Martha, verse 21. Martha runs out to meet him and she says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus comforts Martha through conversation. He reasons with her. He intellectually engages with her. Maybe Martha was a five on the Enneagram. Fives are often called the investigator because they are very cerebral and they attempt to understand their environment through knowledge and reason and research. Like I said earlier, I'm a three on the Enneagram, but I'm a big fan of fives. Some of my very favorite people are fives, including my brilliant wife, Amy. I don't know if Martha was really a five or not, but Jesus knows her so well that he knows exactly what she needs in this moment. She doesn't want to just be handed a cliche, and she isn't ready for a hug just yet. She wants to hash it out. She wants to talk it through. So that's what Jesus does. He uses reason to remind her of the coming resurrection and of his own power to give eternal life to everyone. Notice, Jesus isn't scared away or even offended by Martha's anger. He knows her. He knows what she needs and he ministers to her in a unique and personal way. And it works, right? Martha verbally processes what has happened and concludes with an affirmation of who Jesus is and the power that he has. Then, knowing her sister could use some comfort too, Martha goes and gets Mary. Verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept. John 11, 35. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. I remember going to like Bible camp or Bible school and Sunday school class, and we had to memorize a verse of the Bible. We could pick any one. This was always my go-to. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. It's easy. It's short. It's impossible to forget. But I think that for my entire life, I assumed that in this story, Jesus wept at Lazarus's grave, right? He talks with Mary and Martha, he talks with the people, and they all travel over to the grave site where Lazarus is buried, and Jesus, seeing his friend entombed there, just falls apart. But that's not what it says. They don't go to the tomb, actually, until verse 38. So Mary runs to Jesus while he's walking down the street toward their house. She sees him, collapses at his feet, and starts to sob. And that is when Jesus starts to cry. 
Jesus doesn't weep in front of the tomb. He weeps with Mary. Jesus doesn't talk things out with Mary like he did with Martha. He asked the people with her where Lazarus is buried, but he actually doesn't say anything to Mary. He knows her, and he knows that's not what she needs. She's different from Martha. What Mary needs is Jesus to enter into the grief with her. So that's what he does. Right there in the street, just outside the village, in front of everyone, Jesus weeps with Mary because that's what she needed. Now, I don't know if you caught this, but the sisters say exactly the same thing to Jesus, word for word. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They're going through the same tragic event and even say the same words, but they do not need the same kind of care in that moment. Mary and Martha are unique individuals and Jesus cares for them in unique ways. It's an absolutely beautiful thing to behold. There's still one more sibling in the story. Let's see how Jesus uniquely cares for Lazarus. Verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now think about it. As Lazarus lay dying, I'm sure he wondered where his friend Jesus was. He knew his sisters had sent word to him, and he knew that Jesus could heal whatever it was that was ailing him. Lazarus had seen or heard about Jesus' miraculous healing many times, but now it's him who needs to be healed. And his friend Jesus is nowhere to be found. Can you imagine how hard that would have been? Laying on your deathbed, knowing that one of your very best friends has the power to save you, but for whatever reason, hasn't done so yet. As he slipped closer and closer to death, I'm sure Lazarus thought, it's too late. Jesus isn't going to come. He's not going to show up. I'm going to die, and Jesus doesn't care. As Jesus walked up to that tomb, he knew what Lazarus needed. You see, Lazarus needed to be reminded of just how much Jesus loves him. When he walked out of that tomb, Lazarus found out that it's never too late for Jesus. Even if it doesn't look the way we imagined it or go the way we think it should, Jesus always shows up and he always reminds us of just how much he loves us. So just like he did with Mary and Martha, Jesus loves Lazarus in a unique and personal way. Because y'all, Jesus' love is really what this story is all about. Remember verse five, the one I said is the foundational statement. Now Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. This is the foundational statement for this entire passage. All of this happened because of Jesus's great love for them. Love undergirded everything that Jesus did. It even drove him to the cross. Because of the great love with which he has loved us, Christ died for us. And just like Lazarus was resurrected, Jesus overcame death with life and showed us that nothing is more powerful than God's love when he rose from the dead. That love, it's the same one that God has for you and for me. The most famous verse in all the Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to save us. And that is certainly true. But God doesn't just love the whole world. 
He also loves every single person in it. He loves each and every one of us in unique and intimate ways. See, my friends, our God is not distant and removed. He put on flesh and came to earth as Jesus so he could show us just how great and just how personal his love for us really is. Like I said earlier, God doesn't love us with a one-size-fits-all kind of love. He's not just handing out carbon copies of his affection to every person, regardless of who they are or how they are wired. He loves all of humanity equally, but he loves each human uniquely. Let me say that again. He loves all of humanity equally, but he loves each human uniquely. God knows exactly how you're wired because he made you that way. He knows your Enneagram number, even if you don't. He knows your Myers-Briggs letters. He knows everything there is to know about you. Whether you need to talk it out like Martha, cry it out like Mary, or be reminded of how much Jesus loves you like Lazarus, God knows what you need, and he will meet you there. He knows you because, you, because he created you. You are one of a kind. He made you uniquely, and he loves you uniquely. And because of that, all of us, we can come to God with confidence, even in our most difficult moments, knowing he will give us exactly what we need. Now, I don't know about you, but after the last couple of weeks we've had, after the last year we've had, I desperately need that reminder. So my challenge for you today is very simple. I want you to just rest in this truth. I want you to find comfort in knowing that you are uniquely made and uniquely loved by God. So this morning as I close, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do just that. To find rest and comfort in this truth. This book is called When God Made You. It's my very favorite children's book. I think it always freaks my kids out because I always want to read it to them at night and then I start crying and I can't make it all the way through and they always want to read something else. So sometimes I wonder if this book is about me really or it's about them. But I'm telling you, this book, more than any other, not just children's book, but book aside from the Bible I've ever come across, it helps me uniquely understand and rest in the fact that I am one of a kind and that God loves me with a one of a kind love. So I'm just gonna read it over you as we close today. And I want you to just rest and find comfort in this truth. When God Made You by Matthew Paul Turner. You, you, when God made you, God made you all shiny and new, an incredible you, a you all your own, a you unlike anyone else ever known, an exclusive design, one God refined, you're a perfectly crafted one of a kind. Because when God made you, somehow God knew that the world needed someone exactly like you. You, you, God thinks about you. God was thinking of you long before your debut. From the very beginning amid history and time, you little one never left God's mind. God imagined your eyes, your head's shape and size, and he knew what you'd look like when you felt surprised. God pictured your nose and all 10 of your toes, the sound of your voice, God had it composed. The lines on your hand, your hair, every strand, God knew every detail like it was all planned. Out of billions of faces from cultures, all races, people God made from all different places, God knew your name, your picture is framed. God's family without you would not be the same. Because when God made you, this much is true. The world got to meet who God already knew. You, you, when God sees you, God delights in what is and sees only what's true. That you, yes, you, in all of your glory, bring color and rhythm and rhyme to God's story. 
So be you, fully you, a show-stopping review. Live your life in full color, every tint, every hue. Discover, explore, have faith, but love more. And learn and relearn all that God made you for. Use your talents and passions, those gifts that God fashioned. Think up ideas and then put them into action. Because God loves you creating, your true self displaying. When light on the inside through art is portraying, when you make believe, the stories conceive, the heroics, the magic, those tricks up your sleeve. When you dance alone, spinning like a cyclone, being whoever, whatever, in a world all your own, God smiles, and here's why. In the spark of your eye, a familiar reflection shines bright from inside. Because when God made you, the world ood and odd, and in heaven they called you an image of God. You, you. When God dreams about you, God dreams about all that in you will be true. That you, God's you, will be hopeful and kind, a giver who lives with all heart, soul, and mind. A dreamer who dreams in big and small themes, one who keeps dreaming and journeys upstream. A mover, a shaker, a lover of nature, a builder of bridges, you, the peacemaker, A you who views others as sisters and brothers and lives by three words, love one another. A confident you, brave and strong too. You being you is God's dream come true. Because when God made you, all of heaven was beaming. Over you, God was smiling and already dreaming. I don't know what you're walking through right now. I don't know what you've been through in your life. I don't know what you've been told about yourself, about flaws or imperfections that you may feel or that others may have placed on you. But I know this, you are one of a kind. You are one of a kind. God loves you, and he made you, and he doesn't make mistakes. And that he doesn't just uniquely make you and then toss you into this world to do it all by yourself. He uniquely loves you and walks through it alongside of you. Just like Jesus did, God in the flesh with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in this story, God knows you, and he loves you. He has an intimate and personal relationship that he wants to have every moment of every day with you. So when you're struggling, when you feel beaten down by the virus, by the snowstorm, by all that is going on in our world, all the struggles we walk through, know that God not just uniquely made you, but that he uniquely loves you. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you are not a God far off. That you, God, came to earth as Jesus put on flesh, God incarnate, God with us, Emmanuel. And that you lived and you loved in such a way that you showed us what it was always supposed to be like to be human, yes, but you also showed us what God is like, the fullest, most beautiful expression of who you are and how you love. So God, I pray as we rest in this truth that you uniquely made us and you uniquely love us, God, that we would find comfort and hope in that, that no matter what we are walking through, no matter who we are or what we've done, we can know that you are with us that you love us. God, and that you care for us. Not in the same way that you care for everyone else, God, but in unique and beautiful and intimate and personal ways. Help us trust you. Help us lean on that love that you have for us in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I pray.